Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Delia O'Brien, and I'm the small ruminant specialist. I'm with Virginia Cooperative Extension at Virginia State University. And you're joining us for our second um, webinar for the small ruminant series that will be held until the end of the year. Um, today's topic is, is on record keeping and profitability. Are you making a profit? And so our speaker tonight is Dr. Nikki Whitley. And Dr. Nikki Whitley has 20 years hands-on experience working with small ruminants, running university farms and assistant producers. She has bachelor's and master's degrees in animal science from the University of Georgia and a doctoral degree from Mississippi State University in animal physiology. After graduating with her PhD, Dr. Whitley worked in a postdoc training position at the University of Missouri before being hired at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, where she expanded sheep and goat numbers, facilities, and research efforts. And that's how I know Dr. Nikki Whitley. She was my mentor, my advisor at um, the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, she did the same at North Carolina a t State University, working there for nearly eight years before accepting a position at Fort Valley State University in 2015, where she continues to serve at, as the state small ruminant specialist for Georgia. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Whitley so she could start, um, she could start speaking on this topic. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, so I, t I titled this talk, Are You Making a Profit? Um, but really, we can keep records whether our goal is to make a profit or not. So even if you had one goat or one sheep, you can still keep records on that animal because we do it for our pets, right? We keep our health records on them. If they go mm -hmm. to a vet, if they need any treatments, those kind of things. So you can still keep records. and and. We're we're kind of nerds. I'm sure Dr. O'Brien is the same way. Um, we like data. We like information, and so we're gonna we're gonna keep records. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk to you today about is keeping records, the kind of records you can keep, and how that can affect your farm profitability. Yes. Mm hmm. Okay, so my title was, How Are You Making a Profit? And how do you know if you're making a profit or not? And what is that? Sorry. Somebody kicked me off. All right, so how do you know if you're making a profit unless you are going to keep records? And so we don't want our animals to keep records for us, but these were some cute clip art uh, pictures of of sheep and goats keeping records. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to remind everyone, could you please mute yourselves? Um, I'll continue to check throughout the talk, but it, it really interferes with, um, with the presenter's talk if, if you are unmuted. So um, please check and make sure you are muted. Thank you. And I keep getting kicked off. I don't know what's going on. We're seeing your presentation and everything still. Oh, um, I can't you, see. Are you on you? You might be on um the notes where we can see um the next upcoming slide. Should you maybe look and change your screen? I can't see my screen at all. Can't. Okay. Nope. Yeah. Yes. All I can see is you. <laughs> I mean, okay. not you, but a lamb. A lamb. Okay. So maybe um, stop share. And, and start again. Yeah, and okay. start again. Okay, there we go. You can see it now? Yes. 
Okay, good. Nikki, can you hear me? We can't hear you. You're muted. Sorry, I was talking. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm having some serious technological problems, that, and I'm yeah. usually the one telling people how to fix them. But anyway, yeah. okay. So when we look at at record keeping, I said, you know, how do you know if you're making a profit unless you keep records? And one of those things that one of these, this slide happens to be from Susan Shanian's talk. So it's um, more detailed talk um, on profitability itself, but it goes along with the same kind of things that we're talking about here. If you don't keep financial records, you don't know if you're making a profit. If you don't know what it costs you to raise a lamb or kid or, uh, or to produce that milk or to make that soap or to um, harvest that that fiber, you, you're not going to know what to charge for those products. You won't know what's a profitable price. You need records to file your taxes, to apply for grants or loans. You don't know if you're using good best management practices that are profitable if you don't keep those production records and you don't know what animal may be making you a profit or who might be freeloading if you're not keeping these individual animal records and with the, that we say well what records do we need to keep and definitely want to keep those that are important for calculating a profit Very simply, profit can be described as your outputs, what you get off of the farm, how much money you get out of sales minus inputs or what you put in to developing that product that you've sold. In more detail, and Susan may cover this when she talks about enterprise budgets, we have income and then we, we take away our operating costs or our variable costs and our fixed costs and that's going to be our profit. So we know we're going to want to try to keep up with, keep records of those things that are going to influence our profit. This is an enterprise budget. Again, Susan will probably go over those in more details. So do we need to just keep up with that, with what's in here? what's on our schedule f or do we also need to think about things that impact these items uh yes both of those we need to take take into consider both of those because both the outputs and the inputs are going to impact our profitability and so things that that influence those are going to be important to keep a record of some of the main drivers of profitability are feed costs, reproductive efficiency, and market prices. And we'll talk about some other things and things that are related to those as we go through. We look at feed costs, 75% of the costs in a goat or sheep enterprise is feeding them. So what is that costing you? Individual farms will have different costs for feed, but it is gonna be a major cost of sheep and goat production, especially if you're using commercial or bagged feed. Um, some of the supplements can be uh, pretty expensive, feed tubs and those kind of things. Um, you need to keep a record of that. those costs, keep a record of the feed stuffs if you mix your own and the, the cost of those nutrients that you're adding. And then hay and, and looking at the cost of your hay, including losses. So you want to manage those losses so that hay losses so that you're and nutrient losses in the hay so that you are reducing the 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 basically the inputs that you're going to have to have to make up for those nutritional losses so we're keeping a record of all of those things and realize that pasture is not free we need to keep up with the inputs like seed fertilizer lime equipment and labor 
for planting, mowing, spraying. Um, and then look at the outputs from the, that. So s some of our pasture, if it's costing you a lot to maintain your pastures, but your animals aren't growing, in other words, you're not getting the output out of it that you need, then you can also be losing money that way. If you're overstocking, you could be losing money thinking that um, if you have more animals on your on your acreage that you're going to be making more money, but that's not necessarily the case. Along with that, we look at feed efficiency. Man, the amount of feed per pound of product produced, whether that be gain in the offspring, uh, milk, meat, itself, retail butts, wool, cashmere, mohair, whatever your product is, how much feed did it take to get them there? You can't starve a profit out of an animal, so you need to balance that. You you don't want to have to you don't want to be underfeeding or overfeeding. You want to measure and record the feed and then track the product of that. So looking at feed to gain, how fast did they grow? How much feed did they did they eat? To look at how much feed it costs to put on a pound of gain. And know that there are breed and individual differences. There are genetic differences. We know this, right? So we know that that we want a fast growing male to make fast growing babies. How do we know which individual male for example, is giving you the best growth or the most milk or the best fiber if you aren't keeping records and measuring those things. Reproductive efficiency has a large impact on profitability. And this is how, this is an example of calculating laminar kidding percentages and, and then the next slide will look at kind of how that impacts your profitability. In this example, and again, this comes from Susan Shane, if you have 60 does or ewes, 98% of those have babies. That means there's 59 that actually had the babies. If they each had two, and there's 200% um, of that, then they you'd end up with 118 kids born live. If 5% of those die before weaning, then you have 112. 5% of those may, may die after weaning. That gives you 106. And then that's the total produce. You sell seven. You keep nine. No kids for replacement, which is about 15%. And then it gives you a percent kid crop of 177% or 1.6 kids marketed per doe. When we look at what that means profitability wise, if your laminar kidding percent wasn't 177%, if it was 75%, then that means not every animal had a baby, then you're losing money. Even if every animal has a baby, you could still be losing money. Now, this is demonstration purposes only. Obviously, you would put your own data in to calculate if what it takes for you to make a profit. But in general, we say, and Do Dr. Ralph Noble has, has, I've heard him give plenty of talks and he's just, just, you know, really made a point to say that the first lamb or kid should pay for the upkeep on the dam or mother and it's the second one that starts helping you make a profit so you want to shoot for those twins now the average for the industry for sheep is i think 1.05 lambs per you and so that's not necessarily where where we want to be we want to be up there at a higher level so we can't really make a profit if we're looking at just being average and we, and again, in this example, as the number of lambs or kids that you have 
per female goes up, then your profitability goes up. Now, obviously, again, this is just an example because you can get to a point uh, where you have to look at optimizing those inputs because if it takes you so much money to get to a certain point that you're not making the money back, then you again you, you could be shooting yourself in the foot if you if you put too many inputs in and it doesn't balance out with your outputs either getting more money per animal or producing more animals or producing uh, faster growing animals um, or more milk that kind of thing when we look at the things that impact our reproductive efficiencies then these things in yellow, definitely we can keep records that will help us to optimize those things. So yes, we're going to have records for the ones in yellow. And probably for the ones in blue, there's some records that can, can help us match, match those things up and optimize those things as well. For example, uh, for... Breeding seven to nine months, we want to make sure we can breed at seven to nine months, which means they need to be um, growing well. So they're 70 to 75 percent of their mature body weight at that time. So we can keep records. Did they make that body weight? Did they get pregnant at seven to nine months? Um, selection, keeping records of our offspring for for replacements to determine if we're selecting the most prolific or fertile, uh, prolific meaning number of babies born for the genetics to pass that on. Pr Crossbreeding, what breeds do you have? Keeping records on the females to see they're underperforming and cull, which means removed from the breeding herd, those that aren't making us a profit. Lamb losses, pregnancy status, all of those things can be measured and recorded and tracked for individual animals and their offspring. Again, rams, if we test them for breeding soundness, we can keep track of what those what was his motility at that point. What was the morphology? What were the results of that? And keep that and track it for those animals. All of those things, we can use records to help us. These are some of the things that we're going to be shooting for. So say we're going to keep records of who's pregnant and who's not. We want to make sure that we get at least 95% pregnancy rate. So if we put males in with them, 95% out of 100 should get get pregnant within our breeding season we do want to have a controlled breeding season because that's going to influence our profitability as well so we control breeding so they're not just willy-nilly breeding as they want because it's going to be hard for you to keep records and really know what animal has had a baby for you that year if they're just all mixed up and running together who's the sire if you have multiple males out there um, there are things that you can do to kind of track, track those things, but keeping records is, is a good, is the, is the main thing we want to do to, to, to help maintain our profitability, know who's, who's freeloading and who's being a productive individual in our herd. So pregnancy rate minimum of 95%, but we would prefer 100%. Lambing, hitting percent, we would prefer two per female. We would like twins at least, but one and a half per female is the minimum. We prefer to have less than 2% abortion, less than 5% early mortality or death loss, less than 2% death loss after day 30 to weaning, um, only have to call 15%. Mortality is low. We don't want to have to assist in birthing. All of those things are, are records that you want to keep. Write those things down so you can calculate in your herd what are these percentages. 
we want a body condition score at breeding three to three and a half um, on a scale of one to five. I prefer um, a little bit higher um, at, at birthing than three to three and a half because I know they're going to lose weight, especially if they're very productive. And then efficiency, we want to look at, uh, we prefer uh, 100% that she is weaning um, at least 75% minimum of her, her weight in, in her litter. So when we're looking at feed and reproduction, those two things we know impact our profitability. So what records are we going to keep? We're all, we're going to start with identifying our individual animal. And we can do that with tags, tattoos, microchips, or even ear notches. So if you look at this on the right-hand side, this animal has a scrapey tag, um, an individual tag, which it doesn't look like it has a number anymore, or maybe the number's on the other side and they messed up when they tagged it, or maybe it's just an identification tag. So they said, green means go, I'm going to sell that animal. Um, it also has ear notches, and, and this is a, a form of identification you can use with small ruminants. Identification is required for the uh, scrape eradication program, so you're going to have to do some identification of animals when you sell or move them, and there are some instances in which you don't have to use this uh, national identification, this official identification tag that uh, identifies the farm, the state that it comes from, the farm that the um, the specific farm identification number and then the animal identification number on those tags. There are some instances where they don't have to have that official tag, but there are um, different types of scrapey tags that you can use down here at the bottom. Ohio State um, had this picture and it shows metal tags, um, smaller tags, RFID or these electronic tags like shown within these sheep here in this picture. Um, all different types, bigger ones to smaller ones. I used to use two, a small one on one ear and, and a larger one on the other, so that if they lost one, hopefully I would have the other. With the scrapey tags, you, you're you not supposed to remove them. You're supposed to keep up with all of that information. There's, it's, If you haven't gotten scrapey tags before, you can get some for free it, usually and to see if you uh, uh, can get those, there's contact information here. Um, but there are exemptions, like I said, when you don't have to have those tags. But all of this is related to record keeping. You have to have those animals identified. And the scrapey program includes records. So when we're talking about record keeping, we have to talk about keeping the records at least for, for the scrapey program because it is a required mandatory program for trying to eradicate scrapey, which is like um, mad cow disease, but in sheep. So it's the same kind of prion disease. So we want to try to make sure that we're keeping all the records that the government requires. This is some of the information that you have to keep. And I'm not going to read it because you can access it through the APHIS site and, and get that information. But you have to keep it for at least five years after that animal leaves your property. All of that. All right. So that identification that you use is going to be tied to that animal in your farm records and that's going to allow you to track health production offspring production financials including the market prices of the offspring and your products um, and disposal like when did you sell that animal and how much you know the financial how much did you get for that um, or did the animal die how was that animal removed from your herd or your flock when we look at reproduction records, because we talked about how reproduction is, is important, reproduction, reproductive efficiency is important for profitability, 
um, we can look at things like pre-breeding preparation. So anytime you give vaccinations to the to a to an animal, you can record that. If you're working them as a group, so if you have a hundred and you're vaccinating all 100 of those, you know, you can say pasture three all vaccinated with this so you have that record you know which animals are in that pasture if you have thousands of animals then you 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 looking at them as a group may be much much easier than trying to keep a record of each individual one when you do checks to see if they have foot rot they their feet need to be trimmed um if they have any udder spoiled, spoiled udders, any issues with their udders that you need to to call them before you're breeding. If you're doing synchronization programs, you have your ear tag numbers that you're going to synchronize and, and the dates that you're going to synchronize them, what you give. So that you can prepare for breeding. And I mean, extra synchronization, you can use that to synchronized estrus so you breed in a all in naturally and all in a, a, a confined time period or you can use it for artificial insemination embryo transfer that kind of thing then when you actually do your breeding you the date you put males in or the date you did the artificial insemination which males went with which group their due dates so that you can prepare for kidding and lambing the number born when they actually when they actually kid or lamb the number they had the number that, that were alive the any any that were stillborn the sex and birth weight of each one when you tag them those tag numbers if you have a, a lot um and depending on what kind of situation you're in some people will use paint brands and, and brand the babies um, with the with the dams so that they know which dam it goes to. But identifying that animal and then keeping those records. This is an example of some information from a, one of my colleagues sent me some data. And from 2010, this was records, their birth records. So the kid, their mama their daddy the birth date the uh, birth weight the sex the type whether they're twins triplets or singles and any comments and in this in this case um what do you think we would want to do with this this girl number 326 probably want to get rid of her right so this gives us an idea and while you're at it, you've kept that record. You know that that's a bad mama. You may not want to keep that offspring. Although uh, genetically, I will say that epigenetics tells us that this, this female, number 1018, was adopted by a good mother. So her mama was bad, but she was adopted by a good mother. She's more likely to be a good mother than this one that the bad mama kept. So keeping up with this record, these records are gonna help us to determine who we should keep, um, both the female that had them, also the sires and the offspring themselves if we want to, to keep them for breeding. So we, in our offspring records file, it could be a separate file in a spreadsheet program, or it could be, excuse me, a tab within that file. We can sort that data by sire, and then we can get averages for the different sires, and we can determine which buck or which ram is really whose offspring is really outperforming the other, if any. We can get ratios, uh, weight ratios to determine if they're above or below average. You could insert formulas into a spreadsheet and actually do adjusted 
weaning weights, adjusted weights, so that we know, so we know, for example, females are naturally going to be lighter than males. So if we adjust this weight down, then you can co compare offspring apples to apples kind of thing. So we there's birth type adjustments, there's age of dam adjustments, sex adjustments. So you can actually put those in. So you can get really excited and do all this, or you can just do your basic information. You can start with just the basics and move up as you get excited about records. Like I know you're just going to, um, you can add these averages, you can do your formulas, you can put in amounts that if you are, are have some up and you're feeding them and you can measure what they, what they ate and how much they gained and you can get feed efficiency. You can get efficiency of milk production by looking at how much they they eat to how much milk they give you. You can start recording prices and selection grades on those animals. And selection grades mean in selection ones, twos, and threes when they when they go to the cell barn or when, when you sell them and when they're actually processed. And that was for goats. And there's different scoring and grading system for sheep. You can also keep adult records from your females as well as your males. We talked about kind of getting data for, from the males, from those offspring. You can, you, offspring records, you can do something similar with females if you have specific breeds and you want to co compare by breed. Um, or you can do individual adult records and, and use that to, to compare them. For your adult records, you want to start when you get them. So when you put them in quarantine, you have all the information. What is their thought history? If you don't have any of that, you know, you're going to give them the vaccines when they get there. Make sure they have their, their uh, minimum of CD&T shots, uh, whatever. Hopefully you have a history on their deworming status, those kind of things. But you're going to start keeping those records when they get there. And you're going to use them throughout their productive lifespan with you to help in culling or knowing when they're no longer as productive as they need to be for, for them to make a profit for you and so that you will know when it's time to cull. And some of the records we're going to keep, their birth date if you know it, their sire and dam if you know it, um, litter size as they have babies on your farm. For females, you will record litter size, birth weights, weaning weights of those offspring, their own birth weight and weaning weight if you have it, any kind of health issues that come up, if you have to treat them for anything, if you have to trim their feet, especially if you're trying to do some selection purposes and you want to select animals that don't need their feet trimmed as often or don't need them trimmed at all, keeping track of that, deworming, if you don't want to have to deworm often because we know dewormers uh, an issue where a lot of our dewormers don't work anymore. So we'd rather have animals that are resistant to the worms. They don't get worms to begin with. So if they've had to be dewormed, then that may be an issue where you might want to consider consider culling them or not keeping them for for breeding. If it's a consistent issue, if they've had any birthing problems, if they're bad mothers, um, again, you can write that down in those reproductive records and make sure you can put a, a little red tag or an X tag or something to, to help you remember that that one doesn't need to be kept. For health issues, when you have medications, you may want to have a separate notebook or spreadsheet for medications. This gives an example here um, from a, a presentation on SlideShare that shows some of their treatment records. They have a, a separate notebook for that. For this type of thing, if you're going to ship it, you definitely would want to have a withdrawal time. 
If you're going to sell that animal, you need to make sure you keep it past the withdrawal time. Same thing for deworm and vaccinations. There's usually withdrawal times for all of those that you need to consider. So when you're keeping up with those treatment records, also make note of, of withdrawal periods. For these adult records, you can keep prices that, that you obtain. So what you sold their offspring for. So you can keep track of, oh, she's a really profitable mother because I keep getting higher prices for her, her offspring. So keeping that in some marketing records, which we'll talk about in a, in a, in the next slide. And we can write down again, disposal or culling. So for market records, this is an example of how you can keep records and, and determine what would be the optimal time when you would want to, to sell that animal. Looking at their, their feed efficiency, feed costs, it gives you an idea of what weight would be needed in order to, to make, a, make a profit. All of that's going to depend on the price of your feed, the animal feed efficiency, uh, which we want to be have good feed efficiency in order to make more profit. It's going to depend on the breed and the genetics of those animals, market prices, um, and price differences between the different weight classes. So smaller animals generally bring uh, higher prices per pound compared to, to larger animals. Looking at that overall, what did you get for that animal? And this shows an example um, at different selling weights, what the net income is. Again, this is just an example and Susan may go over some of these things in more detail during her talk. This is a, a marketing options spreadsheet from Susan's website, sheepandgoat.com showing different marketing alternatives and what the the price would be at, for those different options for the same number of lambs and kids and live weight for those animals. So keeping records of these things will help you to determine which market is going to be most profitable for you. It may be different depending on your situation. So putting pen to paper and finding out, do, making a marketing plan that makes sense for you. You may do multiple types of marketing, but looking at those and keeping records that will allow you to, to see what animals, what breed types, what individual animals may be doing best for each of these individual types of markets. So, in general, we look at markets and our resources and try to try to kind of match the, the breeds with our markets and our resources. And individual animals may do better as well. Some other things to think about when we're talking about record keeping. You could submit your mails to buck or ram test for central testing it's where everybody probably knows what a buck or a ram test is but basically it's taking environment out so that you out of the the picture um, because both genetics and environment can impact how well an animal does we're trying to get at the genetics how likely is he to pass on good genes to his offspring and so central testing lets us do that in essence, we can send our animals and let them keep records. So obviously we're going to need records before they go because there's going to be guidelines. They have to be a certain age. They have to be born with a certain, certain time period, that kind of thing. So you have to have some basic records, but they can get more detailed information for you like feed efficiency, growth, average daily gain, parasite resistance if they're testing that. Um, scrotal circumference, breeding soundness exams, they can do all that for you and you can get that information. Or you can do on-farm testing where you collect the data and make comparisons among this cohort, this 
these animals of a different of the similar age which we were kind of talking about when we were talking about those offspring records um and then if you have registered sheep that are part of nsip national sheep improvement program you can submit data to nsip and if you have goats you can also submit records to nsip and they can give you breeding value. So in essence, they take records that you're keeping and they give you back information that's going to help you be more profitable. And again, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through. But Susan may, again, talk about that in more detail. You can keep milk records. Um, dairy herd improvement may may have some some calculations that are going to help you to determine which animals are going to be the best to keep. Um, you can keep records of retail meat cuts, the prices you get for those cuts, carcass yield or quality or meat cut uh, yield and quality from a carcass of different animals to see who's making you the best money again in that market. If you're looking at show animals or selling 4-H animals or registered animals, then pedigrees are going to be important and show records are going to be important. Pedigrees can be important too, not even just for registered animals, but for keeping track of, of breeding and in, so that you don't inbreed, unless of course that's what you're, you're trying to do, uh, line breed, but keeping sire and dam information is going to be important for tracking that as well and then something we probably don't think of much is biosecurity records keeping track of who comes and goes to try to keep disease instance instances on our farms down when we're looking at the the nsip and the central test it's going to help us to invest in animals, rams, or bucks with proven genetics. And this, again, is just an example that Susan made up of how keeping records on your rams or buying rams or bucks with records, with genetic information provided, can help you determine how much you can afford to spend for a ram with those proven genetics. So if he can make you a over $1,000 more income over two years, and that's just from his offspring, not counting the genetics that he then puts in any replacements, then if you spend less than that, you're way, you're already a ahead of the game. If you spend rest the if you spend less than that for that ram. We talked about records are important for taxes. I believe we mentioned that already, but that's going to help us to minimize our tax obligation so we'll know um, what all we can deduct and we want to try to deduct everything that we can, take care of, uh, take advantage of any sales tax exemptions that we have and, and be aware that the IRS wants you to try to make a profit. Our labor costs are something that we should record and, and try to use that information when we're thinking about things that we want to implement. So sometimes it's really cool. We see a, a new piece of equipment that we're like, oh, man, that would be so nice to have. But we have to make sure that those that new technology is is going to be profitable for us unless again your goal is not necessarily profit um, it's a lifestyle satisfaction it's you know having nice animals and nice things then then that's something totally different but it's good to know what it costs you for your hobby so it's good to keep records anyway um Either way, again, like I said before, even if you just have one animal, you can keep records on that animal, how healthy it is and, and how much time and effort that, that you put into that. And there, these are um, some things to think about. 
and try to see if that, again, if those things might be something that might help with profitability on your farm. How do we keep records? Well, you can do handwritten. A lot of people just throw, uh, for financial records, throw receipts in a box and then and then bring them out. I put mine in a file and then bring them out at the end of the year. I'm not saying to do that. Um, that's just that's what what I've what I've done. Um, I've tried fancier stuff. Um, at the end of the year, I do put it into Excel, so I do put it into a spreadsheet. There's other spreadsheet programs you can use. You can use record books and ledgers and things um, from Farm Credit or Extension. Uh, there's software programs like Quicken and QuickBooks. I think I did try Quicken one year. Um, I didn't feel like I was uh, a big enough operation, I guess, to to stick with that. And then there's some apps that have built-in financial programs within the software itself. Um, for production records, you know, even if you just have a little notebook, my dad used to keep a little notebook pocket size in his in his shirt pocket so he could record things. Um, you can keep something like that. They sell some. You can print off your own record sheets. Um, I, I work with a producer who, like my dad, has a pocket notebook. He keeps it in his back pocket. And when I ask him, I'll ask him a question. Who's the sire? Put, flip, 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 flip. He can, he can find it. Um, I try to get him to then put that into a computerized spreadsheet. Uh, and I think he actually has a software program that he has a subscription for so that he could access it on his phone anytime. But he really likes those, those paper records. And again, he has put stuff in Excel. You can, I've used Excel. I've used software. I think I've used Flockfiler and Ovatech. Anyway, I've liked all the software that I've tried. I've liked them. They've had, have plus and minuses for, for each one. So finding one that you like that helps you keep up with what, you want to keep up with and what you need to keep up with and then mobile apps most recently i've gotten into uh, working with a strong group of cattle people and i've really enjoyed having access to the cattle records on my phone so if you find a good software program for your sheep or your goats that also has either an app version. So I like it both on my computer and on my phone. So I can access it on my phone when somebody asks me a question or when we're out in the field and I need to access and make a note um, or update something. But I prefer to be able to look at it on a big screen because I do have my old eyes going on. All right, so that's all I have. I'm sorry if I went over or under, um, and I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, Nikki. Um, I had asked folks to, to put any questions they had in the chat, um, but I should have probably announced that um, initially. So we can go ahead and, and if you have a question for Dr. Whitley, just unmute yourself and just ask the question now. <laughs> 